10 years. 10 years is a long time. And as of the 25th of June this year, Battlefield Heroes is officially 10 years old. It was on that day in 2009 where Battlefield Heroes entered open beta and was properly released for everyone to enjoy. So because of this huge milestone, I wanted to make a video where I go over all the major updates and things that happened over the course of those 10 years, as well as include a few of my own memories and stories of my first ever PC shooter game and to this day one of my favourite games of all time. So I hope you guys enjoy. So starting from the beginning, in 2009 before the game was officially open to everyone, we had the closed beta stages which unfortunately I didn't get to play but it was pretty cool because there were things like um, elements that we never saw ever again in the game, things that were exclusive to closed beta. So there were two short range semi-automatic pistols that got scrapped and they never made it past closed beta. They were basically seen as weak and got replaced with the current short range pistols, the burst ones. And we also had a few abilities that were different as well back then. So piercing shot and a fast rifle, you could basically shred a jeep within seconds. And the gunner's abilities in particular were vastly different. The keg had a burn effect to it. Frenzy Fire wasn't that useful. It only really had an accuracy buff at the time, so it wasn't that popular. Also, some weapons saw more use back then as well, like the fast shotguns, because the fast machine gun was actually very weak, and even the default one was stronger than it. So basically, you saw weapons getting more use back then compared to now. And finally, in closed beta, there were only four maps in the game. Seaside Skirmish, which was the original map, the first map, basically the tutorial map. Buccaneer Bay, Victory Village, and also Coastal Clash, which was added pretty late, just before the game got out of closed beta, basically. So, after the game was officially released, the first major update was known as the Heroes of the Fall update, and this came with quite a lot of stuff. There was a new map called Riverside Rush, which was an infantry-only map. Stylish and dapper weapons, which were the first reskins of existing weapons. And we got the prestige ranking system starting from level 10, from Private 1 up to General 100, also known as General C, which I was a huge fan of. Definitely spent a lot of time working on rank ups for certain heroes. And there was a massive balance on the gunner class's abilities. Shield was changed so that it could also be shared with other teammates nearby, making it more of a team playability. Frenzy Fire got an upgrade in that you could heal yourself after every fourth shot you landed on top of the accuracy bonus from before. And finally the keg got a slowdown effect which basically ended up replacing the burn effect that was in closed beta. This was pretty much the first major update the game had. Following that we got some pretty cool and unique videos that the community made that were featured in the video of the week contest. We had classic machinimas and compilations and over the years we also got montages and other compilations that were featured. Some of my favourites from back then especially were Stretch Before You Exercise and Lol's Random Care from Blackwind which are both highly viewed on YouTube. The first Halloween update featured the skeleton and zombie sets as well as a code that was emailed to everyone which gave the zombie face, the skull and an XP boost. Now for a big one, we got the Christmas update which had a lot of changes, VP prices were changed so that a weapon which you could rent for up to a month for a small amount of VP was now only available for up to 3 days for rental and was also a lot more expensive. So it basically meant being a free player, being a freeloader, was much harder and time consuming. We also got super and uber weapons released along with tonics and fireproof underpants. So yeah, as you could expect, the community hated these decisions and there was a massive petition and outcry and backlash on the forums about the changes with an image that said EA failed being spread around quite a lot. Looking back on the changes though, they actually saved the game financially because it was basically not getting much revenue at all back then. Players were quite easily saving up VP to cover themselves with weapons for a long time and the sales were pretty low on clothing items. So really, there wasn't really much chance for them to make too much money. So these changes were to basically influence people to use battle funds to unlock weapons permanently. And the Uber and Supers were also added for the same reason. This came after the team collected data on player interests, so people were far more likely to spend money on guns and slight advantages being super weapons, according to Ben Cousins who was the general manager at Easy back then. And amongst all of this chaos as well, we got the advent calendar, which was the way to introduce all the new stuff, and we also had the new map which was on the last day, which was Sunset Showdown. 2010 started off with the first Dr Pepper promotion where you could get exclusive outfits by redeeming codes found on bottles of Dr Pepper. These codes were highly valuable and the sets were really in demand back then. Not long after that we were introduced to night maps for the first time as well as the vampire and werewolf sets and their own emotes and claw attack widgets. And most of you guys probably know this but the wolf set is still my favourite set in the game and I believe it's just one of the best looking and most detailed sets that was ever made so yeah you can't change my mind on that. 
So to celebrate the release of Battlefield Bad Company 2, we got the Bad Company release which brought with it some new sets, with the Kirilenko set being one of the most commonly seen outfits ever in the game next to the Skeletor, as well as the Stamina Boost widget, which basically gave you 10 health on top of your base health, and some new Bad Company weapons like the M16 and the AK-74. These weapons were some of the most popular and most used in the game overall, even though they were just reskins of the Uber weapons, for some reason people just thought they were better, or I guess they just liked the look of them. There was actually a small April Fool's showcase where some paper bags were being sold for 7,000 battle funds, but once you tried to actually buy them and click on the advert for it, you were just taken to a thread where developers joked about the price of an, and about selling it. But if they did choose to do that, they would have been the most expensive items in Battlefield at that point. Next we got another pretty big update which came with a new map, Midnight Mayhem, as well as a new game mode introduced called V2 Vengeance, more commonly known as Hero of the Hill, essentially the King of the Hill game mode where you have to take control of the rocket until the timer counts down. This was the second ever game mode to come to the game. We also got some new rocket fuel widgets that allowed you to jump high into the air with jetpack equipped, so yeah, pretty cool update. More heroic moments were added to the game, which served as basically just small achievements, some things to work on I guess, and some of them were pretty rewarding to pull off, like duck hunts and big bangs, both of which were featured a lot in montages over the years. The player Joey, for example, had a big bang montage series which was very popular back in the day. The next set of weapons we got were the black market weapons, basically just stolen versions of guns that were already in the game, so as a royal you could use national weapons and vice versa. A lot of people chose to do this with uh, weapons like the Cheezer on the on the Royals. They like to have a national hero with that weapon, for example. And there are a few more as well. As well. Not long after Hero of the Hill was added, another game mode was actually already in the works called Capture the Crate. It was only playable in the public testing environment though, known as PTE for a short time. And the focus of it was basically to capture the most crates in a round by getting to their location and securing them after they'd been power dropped down on different points of the map. But yeah, this mode was never seen again after this and didn't make it into the real game. It was thought that CTF actually replaced it. So now we come to the first anniversary of the game. A code was given out to everyone for free and it had VP and XP boosts in it for two days as well as some tonics. And there was also a bonus on battle fund purchases as well. The next major update in 2010 was the Football Fiesta. Now, unfortunately, I wasn't around for this. I joined just a little bit after which was a shame because this was a really awesome update. It basically came uh, to coincide with the World Cup at the time. And there were golden guns up for grabs. You could win golden weapons if you bought and owned a face paint for the winning team, which back then was Spain. And there were also medals for first, second and third place. And we got the football and flare widgets to go along with that as well. So yeah, it was pretty cool with the, uh, the new golden weapons. It's a shame I missed that, but yeah. After that we got the Action Heroes release, which came with new sets, the Bomb Widget, which was basically a throwable canister that exploded, and also the Punch Widget, which was pretty much like a weaker version of Blasting Strike, but all classes could use it, so it was pretty interesting. Later on in the year we got a new map called Alpine Assault, and for a few days after its release, team members U238, also known as Kane, and Shade Shooter, also known as Salvinius, had servers set up that only had the new map in the rotation, to basically showcase it and allow players to meet and play with them. And speaking of Alpine Assault, there were two test maps that were available for a short time. They weren't ever released publicly, but yeah, they were called Lowlands and Fork. Those were actually merged to create Alpine Assault. So yeah, and those maps are quite unique as well in design. They basically had features that were never seen again on other maps because Lowlands had a railway station and an actual railroad, which stretched quite far, that was actually never put onto any other map for some reason, and it was never, never reused, so it was kind of a shame. They could have done a few creative things with that. A new feature called Deal of the Day was introduced, where each day there would be a discount on a certain weapon, a moat or clothing, stuff like that. This was a pretty popular feature, but it wasn't actually permanent to begin with. Uh, but it did become permanent after a few returns. It eventually went on to be a long-staying addition, and it stayed with the site for the rest of the game's lifespan. So to celebrate the release of Medal of Honor, there were new sets and weapons released based on the game, such as Tier 1 Elite and Specialist Weapons, which are pretty cool. I believe the Tier 1 Elite was actually my first... It was either my first or second set that I bought as a full set. It might have been the Wolf one to begin with, but it, it could have been that one too. Um, yeah, and I also like the weapons that came with that, because they had some pretty cool skins to them. Halloween came next, and it was slightly bigger than last year's. All of the previous Halloween items returned, including the Wolf and Vampire sets that we saw earlier on in the year with Night Maps as well as a new item that made you headless. Now many people at first thought it was quite unfair to have that item, thinking like headshots weren't going to happen, they weren't possible anymore, but the hitbox was actually still there. 
On to Christmas, we got some pretty cool scoped arctic weapons, so for the first time as a soldier and a gunner you could actually use the scope and zoom in. And there was also a charity event for the charity Child's Play, where the sales of the Santa outfits went towards the charity's funding, which was really nice to see, and the first time we saw Battle of Heroes taking on like a charity kind of aspect. We started 2011 with yet another game promotion, this time it was the Dead Space sets because of the release of Dead Space 2, which had a pretty epic trailer to go with it. A milestone of 7 million registered users was reached, and to celebrate it, there was a free code given out with battle funds and widgets, plus a deal which offered an XP boost, a stamina boost, and more. We got female heroes for the first time with the Punk Hero release, which was actually something that was quite demanded and the community was asking for it, which had the Punk Girl sets, as well as a new grenade launcher weapon for all classes, something that else that people really wanted, and we also got new Punk shotguns which didn't actually land critical hits but had high base damage, and the Tech 9 which was basically a close range, fully auto weapon with a lot of critical hits. Now we got a taste of one of the most expensive items in the history of the game. Peacocks were released for the staggering price of 7,000 battle funds. I did actually own one of these myself, but you can understand that these weren't really that popular. You know, the price definitely put people off, and they didn't really like the look of it anyway. It was basically pretty much not liked overall. A lot of people preferred other pets like the parrot and stuff like that. So for Easter we had bunny themed sets as well as the Easter egg widget which is basically like a troop trap and was pretty popular. A lot of commandos especially liked to use it combining it with troop traps and other explosives for massive damage and chaos. In the summer we had quite a few releases such as pirates, superheroes and barbarians and we got new sets with each of those releases but probably the most stuff came from the pirate release where we got the pirate keg widgets which had a knockback to them and also the old burning effect that the keg had in closed beta and the release of the infamous pirate pistol obviously i say infamous because it was pretty overpowered basically when it first came out it was incredibly accurate had very reliable damage plus all classes could have it so gunners were basically even stronger in long range all of a sudden as well so yeah, uh, gunners were running around with pirate pistols, it wasn't too great, so yeah, but that did get nerfed eventually. There were also some magic widgets that came with a wizard release, which proved to be pretty annoying to deal with, but quite a lot of fun in a ranked game just to destroy stuff. So this next thing is actually pretty serious. A hacker group known as Lulzsec hacked Battlefield Heroes accounts, which forced the game to be taken down for a short time. Details from closed beta players were taken, like usernames and passwords, but thankfully there were no email addresses or credit card information that was stolen. Now we got to the second anniversary of the game, which was probably a little bit bigger than last year's, where we got party hats given out for both factions for free, as well as the game being available in more languages, and also an artwork contest. We got a new map called Wicked Wake, which is basically Wake Island from other Battlefield games. A lot of players thought the map was a breath of fresh air. I personally did like it, I thought it was just a nice vibe to it, although it was one of the biggest maps in the game and probably too big really for an 8v8 like Battlefield Heroes, where in other Battlefield games you could basically have way more players on the map than that at one time, so it seemed more fitting for a game that just allowed bigger, more players and you know a bigger map would suit that. We were starting to see yet another new map come to life which was first tested in PTE and known as Royal Rumble back then. This map was playable for a short while but didn't actually come into the real game for quite a few months and looked vastly different when it did finally arrive. So the game teamed up with Minecraft and free shirts were given out for a weekend because Easy Studios was close to where Mojang was based. There didn't seem to be any Battlefield Heroes references in Minecraft though so I'm guessing it was a one sided thing. So I did say I was going to include a few personal memories in here and it was on the 30th of July in 2011 where I got my first level 30 hero, which is my Royal Gunner. I remember it being on a Saturday and on Midnight Mayhem specifically and honestly it was a pretty amazing feeling to get that first level 30 and quite an achievement for me and yeah just a really good moment in general. Celebrating the release of Battlefield 3 we got promotional shirts and also some dino head items with contests and other bonuses to go along with them. Onto what was by far the biggest Halloween to date, we had a new map release which was Perilous Port, formerly known as Royal Rumble from those months before. But with noticeable changes and improvements like the map being at night, with a Halloween theme, with pumpkins, cobwebs, that kind of stuff, and also stuff like more walls were added and an upgraded boat, so it was definitely a more detailed version. 
We also had free daily rewards, which could give unlimited items, which was pretty nice. I actually got a few from that. I remember getting the headless item, particularly on my Royal Soldier from those. So yeah, that was cool. We also got a new machete weapon and also a challenge where if you got a thousand kills with it, you'd get a golden version of it. But this was pretty hard to do because there were only two weeks to complete it. And on top of that, the national one was bugged, so it was even harder to get kills. So yeah, if all of that wasn't enough, we had Halloween shirts, which could be unlocked by winning 10 rounds on the new map. Overall, this was a very solid update and definitely the best Halloween we had. Now we had one of my favourite and one of the rarest items in the game in the spotlight where Blackwin won a sauropod dino mode for making a signature for a developer. The item was only given out by developers a handful of times through stuff like signature contests and other means and it was incredibly rare to see someone with one. I really wanted one myself but unfortunately I was never able to get it. Just a short time after Halloween's massive success, we had yet another massive update with the Rising Sun release. We had a new game mode release which was Capture the Flag, as well as some new outfits and new weapons in the form of the Samurai Swords and the infamous Dragon Fires. Obviously again, I'm saying infamous with this because, I mean you guys probably know, but they were incredibly broken on release with massive damage, splash, air of effect, projectile speed, basically everything. So the game was in one of those, one of the more unbalanced states at the time. Basically games were determined by who had the most Dragon and fires so yeah just because of how powerful the weapon was also like with the machetes there was also a kill challenge for the dragon fires where you could unlock an azure or crimson version for 400 kills but to be honest that wasn't really much of a challenge it was pretty easy to complete because the weapon was that strong and we also got more free stuff in the form of bento boxes which were again like halloween more daily drops um, each day obviously that could give out more permanent items so yeah that was awesome to see because we just kept getting free stuff on to Christmas again now and we got the return of the classic calendar along with the first batch of alternate fire weapons. Max's magnified MG which was a machine gun with explosive grenades, the Barrelomania pistols which basically had shotgun attachments to them and the battle rifles with a single grenade added. The biggest part of Christmas pretty much in 2011 though was the release of the claw which was a free spin each day to win items and at first you could actually use it once every eight hours so effectively three, de uh, three times in a day but it was eventually changed to once every 24 hours the claw was pretty much one of the most liked features in the game because you could just win a lot of stuff that was normally only available to people that spent real money and yeah i like the claw quite a lot at the start of 2012, the game had reached another milestone, 10 million registered users. Because of this, we got some free shirts and a battle fund code, as well as a contest to win even more battle funds, and we took a screenshot of a developer in-game wearing a yellow 10 million shirt and captioned it. The shirt itself was later sold for a lot of funds, making it the most expensive shirt in the game, and also pretty exclusive because only a thousand of them were available for purchase, and they were 12,000 funds each. Some lucky players did get them for free though, because developers decided to put 100 of them in the claw. A video series called Kane's Community Corner started, which was a look into the studio with behind the scenes, sneak peeks, meeting the team, and also developers answering questions from the community. And there was even an exclusive one-use code that was hidden across an episode, which gave out the original Bronto head. Battle funds were changed to play for free funds so that the currency could be used across all three of the games that Easy was managing at the time. Battleford Heroes, Battleford Play for Free, and also Lord of Ultima. One battle fund was equal to six funds. We got the first major update of the year with the Vehicle Mayhem update, which had new wasteland sets as well as weapons and widgets with new mechanics. We got the Blowtorch, which was meant to be an anti-vehicle weapon, mostly used on Jeeps up close, and also the anti-air RPGs, which honestly, they were pretty cool, pretty cool concept, and they looked good in the trailers, but they weren't really that good. They were supposed to lock onto planes and do massive damage, but they weren't that reliable, they didn't always lock on, and it wasn't really that great of an idea or a choice to remove your standard tank buster for it. The new widgets were pocket widgets such as the pocket jeep where you could spawn a jeep from anywhere on the map, pretty useful when there were no vehicles around or you just wanted to make a quick escape or get somewhere quickly. After that we got the scientist update which came with new outfits and new sniper rifles and of course an awesome trailer. Another game promotion came as well, celebrating the release of Mass Effect 3, N7 shirts were given out. Back with the crazily expensive stuff now, we got new Bronto heads with pipes that were for both factions because the community basically really wanted the original item because it was so rare. These were sold for a lot of funds and in limited amounts, making them one of the most expensive items in the game next to the Peacock, and 45 people were actually selected by the community team to receive one for free. 
Next came the robots with new sets and more weapons. The robot arm MGs and the robot SMGs which both had new alternate fire modes. The SMG had a pushback effect and the MGs had a fast firing mode for up close. Following a similar theme we got the space update which brought a new map, Lunar Landing. This was the first and only map to make use of special physics and have anti-gravity on it. We also got new weapons, the Fist Glove Knife, the Laser SMG and the infamous Laser MG which you guys probably already know but yeah it was widely hated because of its accuracy but the main reason was because it was really fast with the fire rate and combined with Frenzy Fire you could basically heal a gunner back up within seconds so it was really hard when you're trying to face someone using that, really hard to take a gunner down because he was just healing back that quickly. Not long after we got the cowboy update again with new outfits and also a chair smack widget and new weapons, those being cowboy pistols, shotguns and sniper rifles. We also got a release with night sets which came with some new broadswords and crossbow SMGs and repeater MGs. The football fiesta actually returned in 2012, this time it was for the Euro. It had the same concept as the previous one except this time you had to have a jersey for the winning team and not a face paint, those didn't count and there were new golden guns for the super and uber weapons with a different gold paint to them. We reached the third anniversary of the game not long after and this was probably the biggest birthday celebration BFH ever had. We got a new map called Fortress Frenzy, free shirts were given out and the treasure chest system was added with free keys for everyone to start off with. The treasure chest basically worked in that you could earn them by damaging enemies and you could open them with keys to get widgets and other exclusive treasure chest items. There were also some pretty cool tricycle emotes which were quite nice and well animated. A merchandise store was set up with BFH logo shirts, hero shirts, hoodies, mouse pads and more. This was discontinued after a while and honestly some of the items for sale were quite expensive such as the hoodies being over 50 euros and pretty basic in design. We got what was technically a new map called Morning Mayhem, it was just a day version of Midnight Mayhem but it had the team deathmatch mode instead of the rocket mode and there weren't any flags to go along with the change. We also got some new sports sets with Olympic shotguns, pistols and sniper rifles and not long after that we had the secret agent sets and silenced pistols and sniper rifles plus the Lil Boomer RPG. So this is another personal story of mine, I reached General C for the first time, I'm a Royal Gunner at this point and I actually reached it twice because yeah the first time the server had problems and everyone was disconnected so right after I got the rank I was basically kicked out of the server and it got reset so yeah pretty weird but yeah I made it again not long after and honestly I think I was the first person and the only person to have that happen to them so yeah pretty weird. Another packed update now, we had the Veteran Heroes update which brought a new map called Inland Invasion which not only featured new vehicles, those being boats, but also a different game mode concept where certain flags needed to be captured before moving forward and more could be taken for the rules to advance. We also got newer World War 2 outfits, veteran weapons like the side feeder SMGs, shovels and the anchor drop MGs. There were also new grenade launchers that were only available to players that bought funds through sites such as Gamefly and Gamersgate, as well as the Amazon code in the box which had special outfits as well. These grenade launchers were all reskins apart from the Amazon MGL which had a bounce effect to the grenades like a mini dragon fire. I did actually get this Amazon pack myself but it was actually after the game closed, just did it for a video but uh, yeah it was still kind of cool to have that. The Warfighter SMG was released along with a promotion for the Medal of Honor Warfighter game as well as free shirts for everyone. We once again got to Halloween which brought new demon outfits, Halloween relic MGs, energy shotguns, skull RPGs and bow weapons as well as a weapon challenge where you could win the Halloween RPG forever if you got a set amount of kills with it. Honestly though it was much easier to just buy it forever because RPG kills come slowly and the requirement was huge. The Punk Heroes returned and got new sets as well as new weapons that had alternate fires, the Brute Puncher shotguns with a grenade attachment and the Nailer SMG which had a shotgun to it. There were also new machine guns, snipers, pistols and RPGs. As Christmas arrived we got more new weapons, the flamethrowers and the snow MGs and freezing sniper rifles. Winter maps were also improved with more snow and blizzard effects and the free cam mode was released to the public which was honestly pretty great for making trailers and screenshots and it was basically what developers were using for a bit for their own kind of trailers so it was nice to have access to it. The biggest and by far most controversial addition to this update though was the workbench which allowed players to add perks onto their weapons like alternate fire modes and weapon range extensions. For the most part the community hated this addition and it was deemed one of the most unbalanced and pay to win features in the entire game. 2013 was a year with a lot of new game mechanics introduced mostly with the weapons that came out. 
We started with a bunch of new releases, the robots returned with new upgrades, we got new weapons such as the unrealistic uber rifle SMGs with an RPG like energy ball for an alternate fire, and the electro slinger sniper rifles with an over the shoulder zoom instead of the standard scope. Following that we had the alien release with the homing gun weapons which honestly weren't really that strong, they didn't really work properly anyway, the sonic boom shotguns and another entirely new concept the teleporter which you could basically hide on the map and then teleport back to it in order to escape from danger. Not long after we had the biker themed update with new tear gas launchers which weren't really overpowered at all, a lot of people preferred those over the other items that came out and yeah they were great to hold off certain areas and flag points. Another addition that didn't sit well with the community was premium accounts which came with benefits like an XP and VP boost on all of your heroes, discounts and special access to a premium store, access to older remove sets and much more. The steampunk update followed that which brought the new healing needle gun, by far one of my favourite guns in the game, it was incredibly useful to have as it not only healed your teammates for a decent amount over time but it also could overcharge them past their full health and let them take more damage, it was also a really fun weapon to use. The biggest part of this release though was a new vehicle, that being the helicopter. The helicopter was pretty much a glass cannon and it was added as a pocket widget as well on onto vehicle maps. Basically the helicopter did a lot of damage but it was very easy to hit it, it could be hit quite easily, the hitbox was huge and it, yeah, it was just quite easy to take down but the spread was quite massive and forgiving. Next we got a long awaited feature which had been teased in very early trailers for the game, the war room also known as the meta game. This was essentially something else to work towards and achieve within the game where winning rounds would contribute towards a bigger goal of conquering a board and moving along it to win awesome rewards and medals. This carried on for various seasons and pretty much had the nationals winning 90% of the time because most players in the game were nationals. Now we got to see some even crazy weapons and outfits. Starting with the mutants, also known as the monsters, we got the beehive and nightmare explosives which would basically cause heroes to run around in a panic when hit, meaning they couldn't shoot for a few seconds unless they used certain abilities and widgets, basically disabling them. We also got the stealth launchers which meant that any class walking into the field would be a lot harder to spot, especially from range. After the monsters we got the monster slayers with debuff guns that fired a field that slowed down enemies that were in it as well as making them take extra damage from all forms of attack. It was pretty devastating to get caught up in to say the least and I remember doing a maximum of about 147 damage on a gunner using a combination of uh, that weapon along with a few others so it's pretty crazy. The 4th anniversary arrived and we got free birthday shirts as well as the cake widget which you could just throw to mess around with, the damage wasn't really anything to be proud of, anything special, but yeah it was a pretty funny thing to use. And following that there was the Civil War release with new weapons for both soldiers and commandos, the repeater rifles and also a new feature, the game finder also known as the server browser. I mean this was cool to have but it was pretty long overdue and suggested for many years so it was weird to have it so late into the game. Before that people were just using play now at random, using bookmark servers or just joining friends. We got a few more themes, the hip hop sets and also the crimson naga and ninja sets and right after that we got to halloween for the year. There were a few new sets like the clown and scarecrow and the war room got a new update with halloween rewards. Now we got the last official game mode in BFH, Team Elimination, which was basically a last man standing game mode where you had just one life and if you died you'd spectate your team and wouldn't respawn. The rounds went by pretty quickly and the game mode was only played on a handful of smaller maps such as Victory Village or in a smaller part of a map that was normally big like Seaside Skirmish. I did enjoy this mode in the PTE but I didn't really like it when it came to the real game. Christmas in 2013 was a bit disappointing because there wasn't an official new calendar like all the other years. We did get some winter survivalist sets and the war room had a winter theme to it though, as well as special rewards. 2014 was by far the slowest full year for updates that the game ever had and we had a massive lack of weapons, trailers and more. The year started off with the native indians release with new sets and also yet another super expensive item, the golden fedora, which was the second most expensive hat in the game and also pretty limited. There was a small easter update but again it was just new sets and all of the items were actually just reskins of previous items in other sets. The first big update in 2014 was the return of the football fiesta for the world cup. There were new sport outfits and this time the gold gun rewards were the stolen versions of the 2010 gold guns, so the originals basically stayed rare and exclusive. Like in 2010 you needed to have a face paint of the winning team to win a gold gun. The team 
didn't actually plan for it this year and it only returned because the community were asking for it so that was pretty nice to see the fifth anniversary didn't have much there were special v leather jackets for premium users and some free shirts but that was about it Halloween was a bit better, we got new cultist sets and a map conversion, so Team Elimination was playable on Perilous Port. Probably one of the best maps for the mode actually because of how small it was and how close up the fights were. Now we got to Christmas 2014, now this was the last major update to Battlefield Heroes, and it was actually quite surprising given the fact that we had, you know, a huge lack of proper content and updates throughout the year, this was quite a nice surprise, we actually had new weapons, the snow RPGs which could be purchased with VP forever, as well as a secret Santa contest which I luckily won with a dinosaur machinima I made with the help of my friends from the Relax Games community, so that was pretty cool to get some special items for that. And also it's worth noting that the snow RPGs were the last weapons that were added to the game. So 2015, it was the last year for the game. Nothing much happened in the few months of 2015 where Battlefield Heroes was still up. Some of us spotted that a six month premium account payment option was removed which caused speculation that the game was closing soon and that did turn out to be true. We got the announcement that the game was to be shut down in about 3 months time from the announcement and a few fun codes were given out to everyone. Unfortunately though developers didn't unlock the store for everyone or give us unlimited funds to enjoy the last few months to the fullest and they had nothing to lose by doing it so it was quite a shame really. I always thought they should have done that because if the game's going to close no matter what you might as well let people enjoy it like I said to the fullest and have everything unlocked so they can just really enjoy the last few months for, for what was left. So that was 2015, the game was shut down on Tuesday the 14th of July and it was thought to never be seen again. Nothing happened in 2016 with BFH, the game was still offline but I was personally still uploading BFH footage to YouTube on a monthly basis that I had saved. It was basically all old footage, all pre-recorded stuff but people were asking me questions constantly like how did I play and how did I get access to the game and all that kind of stuff. But yeah it was just all old footage and I started to play a BFH mod for Battlefield 1942 made by Apache Thunder which was basically an FPS version of BFH and yeah it was pretty cool, it brought back some memories and it was quite fun to record but obviously it wasn't the same experience. In 2017 a miracle happened. Revive Heroes came to life and our favourite game returned. What I thought was impossible, what I thought was unthinkable actually became a reality and I was amazed and also incredibly happy to see it return and we went from being able to boot up the client to playing in the tutorial all the way up to eventually playing against each other once again in multiplayer and it was insane to see all of that unfold. Throughout the year various different projects hosted BFH but eventually Rising Hub was and still is the main project BFH is playable on. In 2018, Rising Hub was receiving updates such as custom maps, weapon balancing, new items, old weapons returning like the closed beta pistols that I mentioned earlier, as well as the claw coming back via the daily spin and we got the return of the store as well, so it was quite a lot of stuff added on to the original game. So that brings us to the current day. In 2019, Rising Hub is still online and BFH is still playable as of this video being released. And to this day, honestly, I'm still so grateful to everyone that worked on getting the game back and I'm so pleased that the game returned and is playable in some capacity today. So yeah, I mean, it's crazy, you know? Time flies. It's really crazy to me that BFH has finally reached this point and is still playable. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this, I tried my best to include as much impactful stuff as I possibly could. Obviously so much happened in BFH and resources are quite limited because the forums were archived, they're quite, you know, it's hard to find stuff, they're, they're gone pretty much. Uh, you just have to, you know, if stuff wasn't archived through web archive it's very difficult to find stuff. Um, as well as like the wiki being limited here and there. So yeah, there, there's not much to look through. But yeah, it's likely I missed out a few smaller things here and there, especially things just to cut down on uh, video length and stuff like that. But hopefully it turned out alright and you liked it. I really had a lot of fun making this, you know. So it's just quite nostalgic, you know, to go back, uh, talk about all these past events, all these things that happened, go over like stories, memories, things I remember from the game, just thinking about all these different years the game had, you know. I mean, obviously there were some ups and, and there were some downs, definitely. But um, yeah, you know, I, I was there for pretty much all of it. Um, stuck with the game for many many years and yeah it was just really awesome for me just to go through all of this go back in time almost and and just look for all the, all the cool old stuff that happened just to make this and I thought it was just appropriate you know to talk about this for like the 10 years of the game 
Um, so, so yeah, like I said, um, you know, pretty nostalgic just talking about all the old stuff. So I hope you guys had as much fun watching it as I had making it. And yeah, all that's left to say is happy 10th anniversary to BFH and thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.